Hello there. The 2023 Academy Awards are just around the corner. Hollywood is currently casting votes for Tinseltown's event of the year. Let's tap into the Oscar buzz now and take a look at some of the contenders. Ours is the dark house with no lights. The Fablemans is considered a red-hot favorite in the Oscar race. Critics say Spielberg's power as an auteur is in full swing here, making it a best director candidate. Spielberg picking a personal and, quote, deeply moving story has people predicting it could also qualify for best picture. You could afford to be a little encouraging. Would you not want him to have to do the one finger to see if he was bluffing like? Chatter among Hollywood columnists has the banshees of Ino Sharon, another Oscar contender. It's hailed as an allegory of politics, and that political bent could land it best picture. Also, don't be surprised if lead Colin Farrell gets a best actor nod. Everyone to a man knows Mozart's name. I don't, so there goes that theory. Mrs. Wang, Mrs. Wang. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? I am paying attention. Everything, everywhere, all at once, wowed audiences, both with its visual style and subject matter. It does not look good. Vanity Fair says it being about love was what won audiences over. And it said it could be a winner for best film as well as best actress for star Michelle Yeoh. Because we need your help. Very busy today. Uh, no time to help you. Some critics think Tar is too complicated in its political moral perspective to be called an outright satire. But its character study quality and the film's overall direction is getting buzz for both actor Kate Blanchett and director Todd Field. Yes. Yes, it does happen. In three, two, one. The sequel that had fans waiting for decades, Top Gun Maverick is said to have an important trump card, Tom Cruise's star power. Opinion is divided, however. Some argue his appeal could lead to best picture glory, while others believe star power to be a thing of the past. Good morning, aviators. This is your captain speaking. A lot of people saying a lot of things. But in the end, you gotta listen to yourself. Speaking of actor power, both Austin Butler and Brendan Fraser could be deemed worthy of it. The former is getting accolades for his performance in the Elvis biopic, and the latter for The Whale. It had an effect on me. I sensed it. For best international feature film, columnists say all bets are off but they still single out Triangle of Sadness as an able satire that attacks capitalist vampires who drain Earth's life. This whole debate will come to a head on March 12th at the Dolby Theater. Let's welcome Julie Lobalzo Wright. She's an assistant professor in film and television studies at the University of Warwick. Hi, Julie. So, Entertainment Weekly says this year features one of the most exciting um, crops of potential honorees in recent memory, in recent Oscars memory. Do you agree with that? I think this year, one of the things that makes it really special is that there may be a lot of very popular films that will end up with nominations. And that doesn't always happen at the Oscars. A lot of times you have much smaller films, but you're going to have some big box office successes that will be up for a lot of Oscars, especially Top Gun Maverick, Elvis, and um, the second Avatar film probably will get a good amount of nominations. Okay, well, for the best picture category, uh, well, I think the Fablemans seem to be the safest bet of the bunch, 
But um, really is hitting the sentimental soft spots in Hollywood. But do you think it will grab home the Best Picture Award? It may. Hollywood loves films about themselves. And in many ways, this is a film about cinema and the love of cinema. And to have that through this great aging auteur with Steven Spielberg and his own kind of personal journey as a young uh, child making films, I think that will appeal to a lot of Oscar voters. I mean, of course, Hollywood, you know, just like you said, loves talking about itself. And also they really do respect Spielberg. However, they seem to be, I think, more excited um, by the merits of everything, everywhere, all at once. And there is this passionate organic support coming from Hollywood ever since its release in early 2022. Do you think it, there is a chance that it will grab the Best Picture Award this year? Absolutely. I think you've got kind of a, a three-way race, especially with the Fablemans, but there's something about everywhere, everything, all at once, which is not the easiest title to say. Um, that's about hope and um, love and um, being kind to each other, which I think is really going to speak to a lot of people in this post-pandemic world. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think for the Best Director category as well, it is not very uncommon for the Academy to honor the unexpected international or art house director, the contender. Um, do you think there is you know, any likeliness that we're going to see a similar scenario this year? It could be. I think Spielberg's got a good shot. He's won twice before for um, um, Schindler's List and for um, Saving Private Ryan. So as he's considered a great auteur, so that is something that could happen where they could say we want to give him another one. But I think the Daniels from um, everywhere is a good shout. And um, there could be some um, emphasis in, in for Todd Field, who seems to have come out of nowhere to make Tar again, um, a film that has a lot of support. I mean, for the Spielberg point, uh, there is this overdue narrative surrounding Spielberg. I mean, Academy has only recognized um, him three times for his illustrious career. Do you find it to be fair or do you think this narrative is a little exaggerated? I think one of the things that's happening with this is the idea of Spielberg aging and becoming a very different director than he was when he was younger. And I think a lot of people do want to support that and to reward that. It would be his first kind of uh, Oscar in this late period career that he's in. He's 76 years old and it might be the last chance they have to give him an Oscar. Okay. Who would you give it to then? I mean, it sounds like Spielberg, but uh, I, I, I want to hear it from you. Who would you give the Best Director Award this year if it was up to you for some reason? <laughs> I think I think the Daniels are a great call. I think there's something really interesting about having two directors on a film. And Everywhere, Everything, All at Once is like no other film from this year. So I think that if I had a chance, I'd probably give it to them. Uh -huh. All right. Now let's talk about the Best Actor category for a second. Um, I think Colin Farrell seems to be the front runner, but I believe uh, that Austin Butler also checks all the right boxes with his performance in the Elvis biopic. Do you think it is really down to their competition in this category? This is another one of those categories where I think you've got a couple people out in front and it'll be interesting to see who the other ones are that get nominations. The two that you've mentioned are some of the front runners, along with Brendan Fraser for The Whale, someone who's got this career resurgence that's happening. But I think that one of the things about Elvis is that whether people liked the film or not, everyone agrees that Austin Butler's performance was extraordinary. It really was, wasn't it? I mean, for Brandon Fraser, I think he really has earned the um, career best recognition for his performance. And, you know, it's really transformative for himself as well, I guess. But I think the film has sort of fallen flat um, with the industry in the recent weeks. Do you think it will have an impact on um, his, his uh, performance being recognized? I think you're right. There hasn't as much... Um 
pool for the film as there is for Brendan Fraser. What will be interesting will be to see what other nominations that film gets. And if it gets a good amount, then you'd think that might pull him through as um, being rewarded for the film. But if it doesn't get as many nominations, if it's just down to Brendan Fraser, then maybe he won't. Maybe it will go to Butler or, as you say, Colin Farrell. And Best Actress, who would you give it to? Well, I, I think we're going to see maybe Kate Blanchett getting in there, having a third um, Best Actress uh, Oscar, well, a third Oscar for her performances. It's really down to her. Michelle Yao is another one that people are really pulling for. And again, it's some sort of career kind of best performance and a chance to maybe um, give her her due. Michelle Williams is another one that's in the running, although interesting they put her in Best Actress and not Best Supporting Actress. But I think we're probably going to see Kate Blanchett walking away with the Oscar. And Blanchett's victory at Venice, I think, gives her um, a razor thin edge for this category. Now, we don't have much time left. I want to touch upon the TV ratings for the Oscars, uh, which have been dropping steeply for years and years now. This year will be hosted by Jimmy Kimmel. What do you expect of the ceremony? Do you think we're going to see a better one? I think that they will do everything they can to not remind anyone of the slap last year. So I think there will be a lot of excitement, a lot of celebrating, again, really popular films. And I think it will be very traditional. But I do think that um, the Academy is always trying to raise the, the, the stakes with the ratings. And there will be some surprises. And do you think those surprises will help? Because, you know, seriously, the ratings have been dropping uh, steadily, really, because it seems like uh, the graphic for now. I think having more films that people have seen will help, but I think that they could definitely make sure to have the right people there. If you have Tom Cruise and a lot of people from, say, Top Gun Maverick, that could be enough to excite people to tune in because so many people went and saw that film. But I don't think they're ever going to get to the heights that they used to in the broadcasting uh, ratings. All right. Well, this was interesting. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe the mentality of a centralized award show is kind of due now in our fragmented world. But we're going to have to wait and see. It will be an exciting one for sure. Thanks so much for your contribution to Showcase today. Thank you. Vincent Price is an icon in American culture. He paid his dues by acting in a series of gothic period films. The Raven, one of the seminal movies he starred in, turns 60 this year. And in our movie Almanac, Alijan explains how Price carved himself a place in the zeitgeist with such a performance. Do you want to come in? The Raven tells the story of a sorcerer who's turned into a, well, raven. And he seeks help from another magician to go up against the wizard who did this to him. Are you some dark-winged messenger from beyond? Let's be honest. This premise alone shows it has little to do with the Edgar Allan Poe poem. But that's okay, because the movie's spectacle aspect is provided by star Vincent Price who plays the aid to the raven. Price's highly emotional line delivery and over-the-top acting lends this production a theatrical quality. And today, it's considered a cult classic. The Raven is not the only free Poe adaptation to have that characteristic. During the 1960s, similar screen translations flooded cinemas. And the brand face of this trend was Price. His screen persona was mostly constructed by the conflicted bad guy struck by tragedy roles. That helped Price garner sympathy from audiences and eventually led to a fan following. He did get to break away from playing villains, however. Another day to live through. Better get started. And proved he could as easily pull off character studies. 
One such example is The Last Man on Earth, which relies on what reviews call his most melancholic performance as the last human being on our planet. Wow! Price's work is still relevant. Contemporary filmmakers like Tim Burton acknowledge his style in their own work. They channelize that type of quirky gothic, which defined the cinema of today. And it's through films like theirs and The Raven that keeps Vincent Price's legacy alive. Italian Renaissance master Vittore Carpaccio's works are on display at National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. The heavily restored collection is the first ever retrospective of the artist to be held outside Italy. Here's more. Conservator Valentina Piovan is painstakingly working on a masterpiece by Vittore Carpaccio. She's restoring the extensively damaged work using the same pigments the artist himself used all the way back in 1502, when he painted Christ's agony in the garden. I'm at the point where I've just finished the cleaning and the putty work. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a painting on a badly damaged canvas with many holes. In fact, all these white parts that you see are holes all over. Unfortunately, they've been plastered. Now I'm starting on the investigation phase, so I'm looking for colours, and very slowly I'm covering this white plaster. This painting is just one of the collection normally kept at the Dalmatian School of St. George and Trifon in Venice. The paintings have been housed there for over 500 years, so sending them abroad was not an easy decision. At first, we were a bit hesitant, because allowing these masterpieces to leave their natural habitat is always a risk. But our restorer began first by checking the consistency of the works and whether the transport would have posed any danger for them. Then she went ahead with a detailed restoration that took over a year. American non-profit organization Say Venice has been funding the restoration work and they've been working hard to organize the exhibition. Setting up Vittore Carpaccio, master storyteller of Renaissance Venice at the U.S. Capitol was not an easy task. The idea for the exhibition um, started in about uh, 2018. Uh, unfortunately, it was supposed to be in October of 2020, but because of COVID, everything was postponed, and it just opened the show. The exhibition will be in Washington until the spring, and will then return home to Venice for another show. Internationally renowned Turkish media artist Refik Anadol has used his latest data art installation to highlight one of the biggest problems facing the world, climate change. While he has plenty of fans of artificial reality's coral, it also got people talking about the issues. But not everyone likes it. Refik Anadol unveiled Artificial Reality's Coral at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Climate change is at the top of the meeting's agenda this year. Anadol said the forum, that gathers political and business leaders together, approached him to create a piece specifically for the event. And since corals are particularly vulnerable to global warming, that's where he started. This artwork is focusing on 100 million images of underwater flora and fauna, and a generative AI algorithm is reconstructing almost realistic creatures, outputs that hopefully one day can be used underwater to create new ecosystem. Unfortunately, due to the climate change, we lost majority of our corals. And the question at the forum is, how can we use art, science and technology and reconstruct what we lost? Both Anadol and the forum made similar statements about what they call a data sculpture on their social media accounts too. And while some users were thrilled with the result, others questioned how it could help fight climate change. 
One Instagram user replied, Beautiful how human creativity can leverage AI to bring forth such beautiful pieces of art. Though another one tagged Anadol and said, they're using your art to greenwash their own actions, when the wealthy have been accelerating climate change and gaslighting us for generations. And Anadol replied, please join my keynote and hear me out and first listen to what this year's attendees have to say. He also defended his artwork and said he hopes to find out is there any chance to use this experience in Metaverse and bring attention and bring purpose and impact? Well, for another Instagram user, the project is not worth it. The post goes, They just used millions of joules worth of energy, time and money to make a digital art that will outlive real coral. Scientists say that at least 70% of all existing coral reefs could disappear in the next 20 years. In the past decade, many initiatives have also been 3D printing the base that corals can attach to, so the animals can form new reefs. Scientists say such projects can't rebuild all the coral reefs in the world, but can buy time. In the case of Anadol's work, the artist trusts in the algorithms he uses and hopes his 3D printed AI data sculptures will perfectly fit in nature. In the meantime, this artwork will perfectly serve as a great social media post. Every week, millions of used textile products from Western countries reach the capital of Ghana. Some go on sale in the second-hand clothing market, but much of it ends up in landfill. Now, one local artist is breathing new life into the unwanted garments. Once dresses, skirts and shirts, this fabric is now telling a story. Contemporary artist Michael Gah uses discarded second-hand textiles to create vivid collage artworks. I source my um, fabrics from um, one from um, Cantamanto, which um, are known for the, um, the second hand, um, like they bring in second hand stuff. So um, I go there every two weeks to buy them. Oh, really? Gah also visits local stores and design studios to pick up discarded fabrics. It's not only a cheap medium, but also an environmentally friendly one. Fashion sense is growing um, faster nowadays, so um, they intend to leave the old fashion um, down. So I go for them um, um, to create my artworks. I don't want them to end up in the seas, in the in the gutters. But Gah can only use so much material. Some parts of Accra are becoming choked with textile waste. Every week, two million uh, second-hand clothes are imported into the country. And investigations revealed that 40% of these items turn into waste and are dumped at the weeps landfill sites. Ga makes his living through his art. His works even been exhibited and sold on the international art market. And just as importantly, his work is inspiring some local design store owners to be more eco-friendly. A new song by Shakira, in which the Colombian star appears to target her former partner, has logged more than 63 million YouTube views in 24 hours making it the most watched new Latin song in the platform's history. She said she dedicated the record to women around the world.
sé ni qué es lo que te pasó Estás tan raro que ni te distingo Yo valgo por dos de 22 Cambiaste un Ferrari por un Twingo Cambiaste un Rolex por un Casio Vas acelerado, dale despacio Ah, mucho gimnasio That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.